Testing one, two. Testing one, two. Can you hear us both? Give us some thumbs up so we can see you. Welcome to our call today. Uh, this is going to be an action-packed call. It's going to be fun. Get ready for your questions. We have a whole list of questions, David, and I have a whole bunch of topics that I'd love to go over. So this is David Van Oy. He is in Let's the camera. He is in the Kansas City area with me. He's with Reese Nichols. And I describe David you as the call, but you are the only one here. Okay, be quiet. He is my favorite systems friend. Favorite systems friend, David. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your team real quick. Oh gosh, does anybody want to hear that? Yes, I do. Okay. What do you want to know? Been an agent for 17 years. Uh we have three salespeople on the team, including myself. I'm a listing agent only, and I have two administrative staff that handle all the details of the transaction. And we'll do, um, we're at 125 deals right now, and we'll close out 140 for the year. 140 deals for the year, two selling people, two admin staff. Yeah. Okay, so first of all, I just want everybody to think about if you're telling me that you're doing 25 deals and you don't have time to do anything else, I want you to think about this conversation and how many people do you coach a month or a week as well? I coach 20 agents in other markets. Uh, so that's 20, 30 minute calls. So 10, about 12 hours a week is allocated for coaching other agents in other markets. So 12 hours a week you coach. Yeah. Uh -huh. You've sold 140 houses with a team this year and you've led it. And so I know that you're a systems freak because you and I have these fun conversations all the time about how do we fix this? How do we make this go yeah. faster? So I had a pre-interview with David and I gave you guys a little teaser about it. I'm going to lead this conversation because some of these things are so simple and yet they were awesome for me to hear. And so let's start with Sphere because I always want to talk about Sphere in this group first. What is your Sphere system to stay in touch with your sphere? Well, I, I think it's probably important to say that it started out as just a checklist, right? So I've always done a fairly decent job of staying in touch with people with my database, but probably eight years ago, I got really structured about the plan to call them every day. So I would fold a piece of paper in half, and we didn't talk about this, and I would write their names down the night before, and I'd put a box next to it, and I would just come in and color those boxes in every day. The other thing I would do is when I called a name or, or saw a name, I would always in the conversation try to think of one other name that it made me think of. And I would call that person and say, I was talking to Shannon today and I was thinking about you. How is Shannon? I'd make that connect. So that's how the, the database started. Now it's a sophisticated CRM that tracks how many times I talk to them, if we've mailed them, if they're on a listing search, if they have a market report set up for their for their current address. So we've built that out considerably from that checklist. Okay, so today, your sphere plan, because we talked about this, you have a top 100. How often do you call your top 100? So the top 100 is a minimum of once a month. And so my CRM will tell me when I go to my top 100 if I've talked to them or not in the last 30 days. And uh, I will go through and talk to them at least once a month. Some of the guys that are probably in my top 10, which I don't really outline it that way, some of them I talk to three or four times a week, if necessary, just about what's going on, especially if they're in business. So if you call one of them and they don't recognize your number, what do you say to them? <laughs> You're talking about just the regular database where maybe I call someone that I've sold a house to and maybe yeah. they worked with one of our buyer agent and they're like, hello, who's this? Yeah, and I will say, well, no wonder you haven't been sending me any referrals. You don't have me saved in your phone. This is your realtor, David Van Noy. Save that in and call me if you know somebody. Yeah, so you also call the rest of your people four times a year. And you've been Everybody in the database. Everybody in the database. Every single person times. in the database. Anybody that's ever bought or sold a house with my company gets a call four times a year minimum. And that, that call is just going to be... What does it sound like? What's that? What does the conversation sound like? Uh, hey, Shannon, it's David Van Oy. Just checking in on you. I wanted to follow up. It's been a while since we talked here. Uh, we closed on the house about 30 days ago now, or let's say it's 90 days ago now. 
just want to check in and see how that's going. If there's anything you need, I want to let you know that we keep a strong list of vendors on hand in case you need any referrals for that kind of stuff. We're talking to a lot of clients about refinancing right now, if that's something that you're thinking about. And while I have you, is there anybody that you know that needs my help right now? If that should happen in the future, call me, call me, call me, or text me at this number. Three call me. And when I talked to you, you told me that when you're doing your lead generation every day, this was the highest energy lead gen that you do. Prospect, oh, to, to the database? It's my favorite part because I, it really literally is the part where I, I really can't believe that I get paid money to do that part just to call people and talk to them. I love it. I love that part. Yeah, so if you're thinking, I don't even know if I would ever call my database or should I call my database, I want you to think about what if you're not and how many, what percentage of your deals this year out of the 140 came from your database? So of the overall, all buyers and sellers together, 55% of our business came from the database. So past clients, center of influence, or referrals, and we break those up a little bit differently, but all that's really considered the database. So those people who know you locally think that you are a master cold caller. That's kind of your reputation. However, you're a master yeah. caller because you also love calling the people that you've done work with. Well, yeah, calling expireds and for sale by owners is probably what's notable because I'm pretty consistent with that. And, uh, and I have fun with that too, but I, uh, I get a lot of results from the calls to the database. That's my favorite part. So show us your jar of marbles and explain this. I love this. You love, you love the marbles. Uh -huh. I'm buying Eddie so Marbles. That's today. Eddie are getting marbles. So that's today, right? So I bought, I bought all these colored marbles, which you thought was kind of funny. And all the marbles represent a different source of business. So today I talked to the reds are expired. The blue are for sale by owner. That green guy in there, that's an appointment I set with a for sale by owner for tomorrow. The yellow is lead follow-up. The black is past client. And uh, white one, there's one at the bottom, but the white ones are the database. So today was a little, so far, it's been a little heavy on outbound prospecting, but most days I like that to be black and white. So I was just talking to an agent the other day, David, that said there are no FISBOs and expireds anymore. They do what? They said there are no good if his bows are expired anymore. It's still 20, 25% of my business are those sources. And it is a reasonable statement to say, but agents are, they're always looking for excuses, right? So it's a reasonable statement to say, uh, if somebody did not sell their home in 2020, as good as the market is, that's a high level of acuity. That's someone who's got a real big problem, a really bad house, their expectations are extremely far off the market or their agent was really, really bad. Uh, so that does create kind of an, a uh, marketplace of less, um, less expired to choose from, for sure. But we still did 20% 20, 20 of my business from that source. Which would have been 28 deals. How many? 28. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I want that you includes to first number owners. Okay, I want you to talk about your shadow because a lot of people say, I have no idea how to time block. I don't know how to stay on target. I don't have a system to make sure that my brain doesn't go down a whole bunch of bunny trails and make sure that I get my lead gen done. Well, let me, let me outline it for someone, I, I guess, if they're building it from the ground up. So if, if you're trying to figure out how to prospect and you're trying to figure out how to structure your day, it starts with a commitment to do the prospecting in the morning. So most of the time the agents will ask questions like, well, don't you catch more people at night? It's about my energy, not theirs. So it's always about my best energy is from about 8.30 to 11.30. That's when I'm most able to make those calls. So that's why that's where the prospecting goes. We follow up and other prospecting can happen, but that's key. So I realized about myself through coaching that I – that I need a babysitter. So I, if I say I'm going to make these contacts every day, um, I'll just kind of wander and maybe I get on a call and we start talking about something else and then the morning's gone, right? I'm sure real estate agents can uh, understand that or relate to that, right? So 
through with my coach, we realized like if there's a bunch of people around listening to me, I'll make some high quality calls and I can set appointments pretty easily. And I do this in a group where we would set 10 or 12 appointments in a day because it was really hyper focused. Right. And so my coach is like, how can we make every single day like that? And I'm like, I, I don't know if there was someone standing right here that was just watching me every day. Uh, I, she's like, great. Hire someone for $10 an hour to stand right here. And of course, that was a few years ago. So in, in between now and then I've had hundreds of different shadows, what I call shadows. And I have one currently who I hired for the month of December. I pay him $200 a week. He gets her at 815. I have to start dialing at 830 and he stands right there until 1130 every day. And, he and just, I don't get to play or do anything else. He just stands there. He just stands there. He's not allowed to do anything else. So if you can't afford that, if you can't afford to hire Shadow, who are some of the other people that you've had come in to shadow you that have also helped you that were free? Why well, let any agent that wants to shadow me shadow me anytime? Which I know is always kind of a strange thing because people work for different teams and companies and they come in and they're like, why would you let people shadow? A couple important reasons. One, the same reason I'm doing this Zoom right now is because I feel a uh, I feel a, a strong inclination to, to contribute at a high level, even though I want to compete and I want to beat everybody in the marketplace. I also want to contribute. So when people watch me, I like to feel like the people that get it are going to do something better, just like this. The other thing is most of the time they come watch me do it for three hours and they run away and say, I could never do that. And I, and I can't do that. I actually think that the ones that aren't meant to do it are scared shitless and never come back. And so either way, um, either way, it, it serves multiple purposes. So I let anybody that wants to shadow me do it. And if you're going to take a break, what do you set to make sure that you're not off on a bunny trail too long? Egg timer. Okay. We set that for 10, 12 minutes and I get to take a pee pee break. And then he comes and tracks me down and shows me the timer and I have to come back. So it's just, it's just a series of little hacks that we have knowing that I get lost. I get on other things. I work on deals. I get off topic talking to people about exciting things and I forget that I'm supposed to have a hyper focus on making the call, making the next call. So basically you've just hacked your brain. I've hacked my, my habit and um, my brain still wanders, but you know, everything else is caged in and if I'm tied to the desk and that's the reason I coach by the way too, is because from about one to four in the afternoon, now I just talk about real estate for a couple of hours and it keeps me in the pocket, if you will. Uh, and before I might be able to take a lunch or a coffee or something like that and lunch or coffee ends up just completely out of bounds too. So I don't do lunch or coffee. I don't, I don't think about what I'm gonna eat or where I'm gonna go or any of those things, the day set. So basically, and, and by the way, who, how do you know who you're going to call every day? I know you use a CRM. They're going to ask me, what CRM do you use? We use Brevity as a CRM. We use Follow Up Boss for lead follow up. Okay. Uh, we, I, use, I use a multitude of different dialers to find data on people, Vulcan 7, Mojo, um, and I use Criss Cross, which is kind of a cold properties to, for circle prospecting into neighborhoods. Okay. Okay, so th those are just what, common questions, right? What website do you use? Use two. Vulcan, Vulcan 7 and Mojo Sells, or Mojo, are what the are two the, dialers. What are the two websites that you use? Brivity. Use Brivity website. I use Brivity as a CRM to manage the database and the workflow of the transaction. What are the two websites that you're using? You use real for myself. Real Geeks. Oh, Real Geeks. I'm sorry. Real Geeks manages my my personal website, the Vanoy Group uh, That's where we push a lot of our lead generation to. And then Brivity. Also, we have another how another website through Brivity that's just designed to to catch buyers looking for searches and also home valuations. And between both sites, I'll you I'll promote both of those. Uh, by way of advertisement to generate leads as well. Okay, so here's the, here's the million dollar question because I know everybody's wondering, how do you keep mm -hmm. up with all of these leads? 
do you what systems are you using and are they automated so so the leads that i generate outside of prospecting that we just would be internet leads raw leads they're all followed up with by the by the buyers the buyer team so i have two buyer agents that are in follow up boss they get assigned the leads they have a system of 321 to follow up on every single inquiry and cross reference it to see if they're a seller lead and push that back to me. And so they have, we manage, I guess we track their response time and work on that system to make sure that the leads are getting followed up with properly. Okay. What's 321? Uh, 321 is when a lead comes in, you're going to call it three times the first day. If you don't get a hold of them, you're going to call them two times the next day and then one time the third day. So a total of five calls minimum is going out on every lead. And this is automated through your CRM. Through your follow-up no, follow bus. No, that's that's the way the buyer's agents are trained. So the so the lead comes in. There are some automated communication pieces, but the phone calls are not automated. That is five phone calls that happen from a salesperson from the company within th uh, three days. Okay, and those are standards and expectations for your team members, correct? That's right. What if yeah. they do that? You know, it's just like any company. Uh, we have challenges where we look at all those numbers as a whole. We look at it like on a month-to-month -month basis. And we look at the speed to lead. So how long is it taking you on average to get to a lead? And we're, so we're always working on that number. So if I look at your number and it's seven hours, you, you know, you might have a lead that comes in at midnight and it's going to track you all the way until you call them at eight o'clock the next morning. So seven hours isn't a crazy number, but I can look at, their follow-up. I can see the call. I can hear the call because it's recorded. I can see the text messages and the emails. So we go back and we train on scripts. We, we train on the system exactly, you know, how many times we're supposed to call and in what order, but it's always training. It's never punitive. Uh, they, they're required to sell three homes a month. So if they're not meeting that expectation, then we're going to go back and review the system, review the process, uh, unfortunately, I, it's been a while since I had to get rid of somebody based on that metric. Yeah, because you've set them up. So they're going to they're gonna want to know, what what is all that little system in? Like, what is, it's in follow-up boss, correct? Like, that's where they're, that's where they're tracking all of their, they're pushing out their calls, their texts, their emails, all through follow-up boss. Yes, and I'm just like every other system that we have, I'm just looking at the averages and then bringing it back to them as a coachable opportunity and saying, you know, it's basically our, our company standard that you're going to reach out to them five times minimum if we haven't received contact. And it looks like your average contact, you're reaching out to a 1.8. What can we do to get that number up? Okay. So if you're not converting leads out there, you're probably not calling enough. Yeah, leads are converted generally somewhere between 10 and 15 contacts. So most of the time people believe like I called them, I left a message, I called them the second day, they must not want to do anything. And so if that's two or maybe even consider it three contacts, I'd consider it two. The average contact is going to convert to an appointment at about 12. Okay. So here's another question while we're sitting on systems, because I want to address a couple of questions that we had from yesterday from Kimberly Abertelli, all the way from Boston. She's one of my favorite yeah. clients that I coached as an agent. After, like, what is your, what program do, do you intake a client, do an appointment, follow-up system look like, and then after closing? What program do you use that on, and is that automated? So when an appointment is set, the first thing that's going to happen is follow-up boss. We're going to set the appointment in follow-up boss. The reason is it will invite the client automatically, and I include some links to our company along with my bio in the appointment reminder. Ah, nice. Okay. So that's going to say what's, yeah, we can share that out. Anything we talk about, you know, we can share it out because uh, so if somebody wants to see any of that stuff, they can. Follow up bosses first. When I click a tag and follow up boss, it's going to automatically add it to Brevity. It's also going to put it right on my calendar so my assistant has it. Right when that happens, she's going to go create a packet, a pre listing packet that we're going to have delivered to the house before the appointment every time. Okay. That was the first part. She asked about after. Well, I guess we can get to that if you feel like that's important. That's a different system. 
After closing. So one of her questions is after closing, obviously you have a very good calling schedule for your sphere, right? And your past clients. Where yeah. does that live? Does that live That's in brevity? It's in brevity. Okay. That's in brevity. So all, once the client, be, once they become a client, we'll say that's kind of the threshold. Bre follow up boss is lead follow up. It's that's the only thing we do is we manage leads, discuss leads, at, add them to a drip campaign to create engagement. Once they've engaged or set an appointment, the intention is to move them to Brivity, get them set up on a market report, get them set up on listing searches if they're also a buyer, and also manage that relationship forever, which means we're taking on the data of all of their information, their, from their birthday to the, their social links to anything we want to know about that client long term. So when I communicate with them forever, it's going to be in Brivity. Okay. And then I want to just touch on this while we're right here in Brivity. Where, do, where does your contract to close, close system live and how automated is that? Uh, that's probably something that I don't get to show off enough that I'm probably more proud of than anything is our, it's really our entire workflow from pre-listing to active mark, active on the market to, to pended to after closing. And, and that would include the listing appointment as well. Um, so what, what I like to do is to take that entire list and determine exactly how many points, like check marks, my assistants are going to do for the clients on that list. And we'll get together once a week, and we call it team building or KPI, which is key performance uh, indicators, and we'll work on how to add, we have a goal right now to add uh, 25 items to the total list of services we provide the clients before January 1st. So, so if I'm if I'm if I'm on your team and I'm a director of operations or marketing listing manager, whatever, I go in, I log into my brevity, and I literally see what my tasks are for the day, and I don't have to remember anything because it's all there, and my brain just has to go task click, task click, task click. Everything down to the handwritten note that is written by a robot that comes from me uh, is in that system with a link with login information. And, and, but it's a, it's a consistent action item for us to every week to go back and say, is this in the right spot? Does the client need more information than what we're giving them? Do they need it sooner? Are there any problems with it? Um, so yes, the entire checklist is there. It is, it is, for lack of a better phrase, stupid proof. They can check the box, and, but it frees them up to do the number one thing that I ask them to do, which is communicate with our clients. So I want to go back. If you're an admin watching this and you've been fighting doing an automated system like a brevity or a paperless uh, checklist or paperless pipeline or anything like that, what would you tell an admin who's trying to keep it all in their head? Well, um, what I think what's important to recognize is that you're probably working for an agent who implements five different systems a year and doesn't follow through on four of them. And so if that's part of your problem, then that's not really your problem. A lot of administrative, it's, it's my belief that it's never their fault. It's always my fault. So I had times with Brivity where the checkbox is there and it says do this, and it's, but it didn't say do this and this. And it's like, uh, okay. So, but I don't look at that and say you need to use, you need to, you need to get better at this. I figure I need to tighten that system. So I believe it's the team leader's job to make that system tight first. But if you're administrative and you have the ability to control some of this or bring this to the team, automation is the key. It's the key to communication. It's the key to service because most agents that struggle to, to, to get above any level, wherever you're stuck, if you, we got stuck at a hundred, we got stuck at 90 deals we got stuck at 110 deals. Whenever you're stuck, it's because you're spending too much time considering what we're supposed to do next and did we do it or did we not do it? And if you could eliminate that and get and offload all of the, the thought associated with it, it frees you up to give service. Yeah, which is, which is our number one goal. Um, one of the questions I have for you, and you and I talked a little bit about lead follow-up, which is one of the questions in here. I'm looking at my Facebook and my notes when I'm looking down, by the way. You talked about how important lead follow-up is. 
So when you're doing your lead generation, part of those calls, your lead follow-up, you said 70% of your business comes from lead follow-up. It's my belief that 70% of anybody's business comes from lead follow-up. So if you, yeah, so if you multiply that number times whatever your goal is, that's how much it's worth to your company personally to have a good lead follow-up system. So let's say your goal is 300,000 in GCI. That means that your follow-up system will, it'll, it'll fall to the level of the system, right? And it's 70%, which means $210,000 of your total GCI will come from your follow-up systems. To me, you can't afford not to have these systems. Short-term, long-term, because you talked about you've got short-term drip systems and you have a long-term drip system. Talk to them about that. Um, well, follow-up boss is what we're going to use to engage. Brevity is what we're going to use to communicate with them over time. In follow-up boss, there's a series of texts and emails that just basically say, we're trying to get a hold of you and we try to, we'd like to talk to you about your home to sell or home to buy. So that's, that's, that's a drip campaign, if you will, but it's an engagement campaign. And it's really, at that point, I guess you could almost call it a branding piece as well. If someone's in a long sales cycle, but we don't know it, then they might come back and go, oh, David Van Hoy, I remember that name. I'm not sure why, but okay, yeah, actually we are thinking of doing something. Now, the long-term plan is once they become a client, if, if you want to call it a drip campaign, it's, it's my intention that every single person in our database in, in Brevity is set up on what we call a market report. And I have virtual assistants that will start some of those. But every time I call a client, if I was going to call you in the database and I, and I said, Shannon, how's everything going? Calling about the house. I'm going to have your, your profile up. I'm going to confirm some things, a good email address, the phone number, and then the address. Did we sell you the home? Any of those types of notes. And I'm going to set you up on a market report. So I'm going to look at it and I'm going to say, probably right now the house is worth four, four twenty five, something like that. Oh, yeah, that's what we're thinking. We saw the one down the street. So then I'm in the market report, it's setting them up on everything from 375 to 475. So every month at, you know, probably minimum, unless they're hotter than that, they're going to receive a market report from me that says, here's the homes that sold in the neighborhood, gives them a chance to engage, reply, and it makes them feel like I'm in touch with exactly what's selling in the neighborhood and see the name. So you touch that one time and then it's automated monthly. Automated. Yeah, I never have to touch it again. So then what I'll do if I if I want to engage with like if I if I said I got to find a deal right now, I want to find a lead, someone who wants to buy or sell right now. I could go to market reports. I could filter it and say, who's who's looking at this report most frequently and most recently? And I get a list of 20 people that have clicked on that thing 11 times in the last two weeks. Well, that's a pretty high quality list of people that I could call and say, how do you like the market report? Have you seen some of the comparable sales? If you sold the home, where would you go next? Yeah, because I think sometimes right now with the market, they're surprised how much equity they're sitting on. They're surprised at all of it. We're still showing houses. People aren't dying right on site from COVID. The real estate market is continuing to move. Uh, they're surprised by every single piece of what's happening out there. Yeah. When I talk to people, they can't believe that any of it's still moving. With your high percent of referral rate, you must have a superior customer service. And I want you to explain, now this is really high level. So those of you who have teams on here, or those of you who are really detailed, and this is like gonna be your, your hack of the year, talk to us about the net promoter score. The net promoter score is something that took me a long time to, to accept, but I think it's the, I think it's, Behind the database, it's the biggest opportunity that, that the company has. But I think it's the biggest opportunity for any agent listening. And I'll tell you why. So a net promoter score, if you just do a quick search on it, if you don't know, it's basically a 1 through 10 rating. And you've worked with companies that have asked you for a 1 to 10 rating on their service before. If you answer 1 through 7, or 1 through 6, I'm sorry, you're basically what's called a detractor, which means that people will go out of their way to make sure that people do not do business with you. That's a detractor. And every business has those. And then the sevens and the eights are neutral, right? And those people just won't go out of their way either way to say, don't use them or yes, you should. And the nines and tens are our raving fans. So 
a raving fan as a nine and 10 are the people that we're trying to get referrals from most often. So every single one of my buyers and sellers is going to get automated and a phone call from me saying, now that you're at this point in the transaction, your home just went live on the market. How likely do you feel on a scale from one to 10, 10 being the highest, how likely do you feel to, that you'd refer us to your friends or your family? And they say, well, you know, we've had a couple of hiccups. We like everything so far, but we're an eight. Okay, I can appreciate that. You're an eight. What would it take to make you a 10? Well, we would have liked to have A, B, and C. So now I have a chance to get in front of some of those things. But if I'm an individual agent and I don't have any staff, but I still do a deal and I cl call them at the end of closing and say, listen, you've been in the house a week. Now the dust has settled a little bit. Do me a favor. The only way that I can get better is if you help me with this part. On a scale from one to 10, how do you feel in terms of likelihood to refer me? Well, to be honest with you, David, I'm a six. Would you tell me why? And if you listen to that answer, you're going to find out everything you need to know about breaking through that next threshold. So that customer feedback is something that we miss in real estate a lot. And I think a lot of people just think, well, yeah, he doesn't care. He got a commission check. He could care less. And by the way, I feel that way about some companies I do business with also. And they don't feel that way. And so just by calling and saying we care about what you think about the experience, even if there was a couple of hiccups, you'd be surprised at how many people will turn into tens and you need tens. Well, and what you're doing, though, too, is you're, you're just setting up your future next client. Right. Like you're setting up the customer experience going forward. So you fix that problem. Now, you also told me that you have these conversations with your whole team in different stages to make sure that your whole team is in, in alignment with this. Tell us about that. Well, so if you have a team and you're man, let's say you're managing one assistant. And this is I think that's an easy example. It's difficult to come to that assistant and say, I need you to improve. Right. Because. They're like, what do you want me to do? I'm working hard. I'm working all the time. How do I get better at this? So this is a metric that we can all agree upon. It's the consumer's rating of each department. So the listing agent as a department receives a score. The listing coordinator as a department, the buyer team and the transaction coordinator, they all receive a score. So if the score is a seven with the buyer agents and it's a 9.2, now we have a conversation where I can say, listen, you're a 9.2 and that's amazing. I feel like you could be a 9.5. What could I do and what could I add to your system that would help you raise that number from a 9.2 to a 9.5? Now the conversation, instead of saying, I don't like the way you're doing something, even though you're 9.2, there's always a metric that we can strive for. And that's the difficult part about everything we do in the business is it's all based on kind of how we feel things are going. This is how I feel the day went. That's how I feel. So I, know, I don't feel it. I know it. What happens if you go home and that glass isn't full? That's not going to happen. But if, if, I, if there's a day when the glass is half full, no pun intended, <laughs> um, we're going to look at that over time. And we're not going to judge one day and measure it with a teaspoon and act like I need to change everything. But if we look at 30 days and say, okay, it happened three times in the month of December, and it usually happens on Wednesday. What's happening on Wednesday? Well, here's what's happening. So now I have information. So it's not punitive. And it, that never worked for me because I hung money up on the ceiling. At one time, I had 50 $10 bills hanging from the ceiling, and I'd make 50 contacts. And any contact I missed, $10 would go to the staff. When I pass out $200 at a time, going, all right, you sons of bitches, here's your 200 up. And they were like, happy that I, our goals were not aligned, right? It didn't work. I'm better with a carrot, not a stick. So I've tried multiple different things. It's not about punitive. It's about learning about your own habits. I love the marble system. I showed it to Eddie yesterday and I told him we're buying marbles for next year because I think that's one of the, that's one of our key things is making sure that we stay on track and get those calls done. Right. Like we should be calling. You know, I got it from the book um, Atomic Habits. I was listening to Atomic Habits, which is an excellent book, probably my favorite last year. And he was talking about a sales guy that had two jars. Uh, one was full of 200 paper clips and he'd move them for each sales call and he'd make 200 sales calls a day. Well, I just want to measure contacts and buy different sources. 
So I was like, how could I do that? And I got on the Amazon and found these big marbles. So that's how I got it. And that's by Tim Ferriss, right? Atomic Habits? No, that's James Clear. James Clear. Yep. Yep. Nope. That's an awesome one. So I want to get to some of these questions. I've gone through yeah. most of my topics that we talked about. And I'm going to come back into inexpensive and expensive lead gen inside of some of these questions. So yeah. what, what are you doing differently with the market shift because of COVID to get listings? Have you felt I think it's a great have shifted? Well, so let's just talk about the fundamentals of the marketplace. Has there ever been a better time to list your home than right now? Nope. Right? Have, have, have sellers been more in control of the sale, more in control of the resolutions, more in control of the pricing and the timeline than ever before. So it's, I think it's, a, it's an education piece at every level. And even whether that's an expired or for sale by owner, or especially with the database, I believe that it's my obligation to reach out and let people know you've been hearing some things about the real estate market. I imagine you've heard it's really great, but let's talk specifically about what's going on in the marketplace and who could take advantage of it, which by the way is always true in every market. It just happens right now to really serve the sellers. Yeah. So you're still, you're still generating the same type of sellers that you always have. I've made, you know, I've made a little bit of a shift over the last six months from uh, from some of the expireds and for sale by owners to more of the database. But right. see, that's, this is where people, like you said, they'll say, oh, expireds are dead. I'm off of that. And they don't even have a database. And now they're trying to generate leads on Zillow or whatever they're doing. That's going to fail. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dial, not a switch. So if expireds are a dial, when the market's hard and the average days on market is 65, I'm going to turn the dial up on expireds and put more of my marbles towards that source. If the expi I turn that down, then I'm going to turn something else up, but I never get rid of a source altogether because every good real estate business needs a minimum of five good sources of, of leads. So what are your five good sources? By the way, do you buy any upfront leads? I know you do pay-per-click. Do you buy Zillow leads? Yes, not very much. Okay. So, um, for years, I didn't buy any leads up front whatsoever. In the past year, uh, not because of the marketplace, but because of our own production limitations, I've decided to start buying some leads because we have the budget for it. My advertising expense year to date is right at 2% of my gross. So if you look at a profit and loss statement, most businesses spend a little bit more than 2% on marketing, but I, it's my intention next year to take that to about 5%. So that's just a place where I can put some dollars and put some of our systems to work. But it's my belief that you should not buy leads until you have a really good command and understanding of what we talk about as the really inexpensive opportunities to create business. And the inexpensive sources are going to be, number one is going to be your database, as much as people are going to fight that and look for the secret answers. And I know that there's going to have to be people on here that are like, there's got to be some secret to that because I'm not doing that. So the database, past clients, and center of influence, you have to engage those people at a high level and come up with a reason to do it. And educating them on the market is number one. For sale by owners and expires are raising their hand and saying, I have a home to sell and there's no homes available to buy. So how is that not a clear opportunity for people to at least reach out and make contact? with something that they're comfortable with. You've got just listed, just sold, which means circle prospecting around houses that you sold or your company sold. Uh, just call into the neighborhood, neighborhood and say, you know, every, we know every time a home sells, usually two or more will sell right away. So when do you plan on moving? Okay, so and if you do that, say it again. Time out. How expensive are the things that you just listed? You could buy all of those lead sources, I think, for $200 a month. Yeah. The database is free. Right. Uh, expires and for sale by owners, I think, are $175 a month, maybe. You can, you, and can, then, you can get them on Red X for $80 a quarter. Okay, there you go. Even cheaper than I thought. Yeah. Or you could just go free. Or you could go free. Or when they show up as expired in MLS, you can go knock on their door. Yeah. 
So I just want to make sure a lot of people are like, you guys must be spending a lot of money to get all these deals. You're spending 2% well, of your marketing budget, 2% of your overall GCI. Yes, it's a very, very low number. And, and honestly, that's up from what it's traditionally been over the past five or six years, some of our best years ever. Zero internet leads, zero, out, zero, none of that. What are some expensive inter or what are some expensive lead sources? Because we talked about this too. So we have a variety of people on this on GSD. And I loved, I loved when you did your intro yesterday and you go, get stuff done. That was so good. I loved your pause. Anyway, <laughs> what are some expensive things? We've got some high-end teams on here doing 40, 50, 80, 100 million plus. What are some of the lead sources? Well, one of the things I, I thought about, because I thought about this question quite a bit actually over the past few days, is we, we recognize things that are expensive ways to generate leads, but we don't often recognize how much it's costing us to be bad at certain things. Okay, explain. So it's expensive to buy Zillow. It's expensive to buy Realtor.com. Because, I mean, it might be $60 a lead in some cases. That's expensive. That doesn't mean I don't have $60. That means as a business model, I can generate leads in some sources for $5 a lead and Zillow 60. That's a high level. Uh, then there's referral sites that we've talked about. There's a bunch of them out there that are basically generating those leads and selling them back to us at a 25, sometimes 35% referral fee. Not to say you shouldn't do that or make it a blend of part of your business, but it's an expensive part of, it's an expensive source, right? But in addition to that, the part that people are missing out on, what's costing you the most amount of money, the most expensive thing in your business is going to be, number one, is going to be commission cutting. Okay. So that was one of the right? questions so, we had. Yeah. We had some good questions on the commission cutting thing. Um, and somebody asked me something that kind of alluded to the fact that I take reduced commissions, and I don't. Um, my average, I mean, out of out – of, 85 listings that we sold in 2020, there was three listings that were taken under 6%. Two of them were over a million dollars and one of them was my parents. Okay, so, okay. parents got a break, fine. I told them you get a break for being my parents, even though I'm worth it, right? But um, commission cutting is a very expensive thing that real, real, real estate agents get involved in. And when they see anybody selling anything at a high level, they always say, he must be giving that away. Or they confuse the buyer agent c compensation as always being half of the commission, and it's not always half. And that's prevalent in a lot of other markets, but not necessarily in the Kansas City market. The other thing that's costing people the most amount of money, I wrote a couple of things that I think we can all agree are super expensive things. One, lack of a business plan. Two, lack of lead follow-up. Three, lack of leverage, which is going to be somebody helping you transact the deal. And then a big one is lack of the right words to use. So objection handling or just a conversation. Um, all of these things are costing you. We said lead follow-up is 70% of your income. If you are on this call and you're like, if I get a lead, where does it go? Hmm, I might email myself. I might put it on my to-do list. I might write it down. I might put it on my calendar. You are costing yourself two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars a year on any goal. You're costing yourself that much money. So if we're looking at, well, these, there's some certain things in my business that are costing me way too much money. No, the the number one thing you can do is go out and increase your revenue by addressing some of these deficiencies. The number two thing you could do is cut some of those expenses. Okay, so if you're listening right now, I would love for you to start posting questions in underneath this video right here. I'm going to finish up the questions from the other day, and then I'll jump. I'm going to jump back to that other Facebook group. So one of the other question is, what is your best marketing piece? I saw that question. I think that's interesting. My best marketing piece. So here's my best marketing piece is a... a listing taken, priced well with my sign in the yard saying coming soon, being sold, and well, then I tell everybody within 20 to 40 houses that I secured that listing, I sell the home and go back and tell all those 20 to 40 people that I sold the home. That's the number one thing you can do from a marketing perspective to get more business. 
So that would be circle prospecting. Circle prospecting alone isn't the best. No, that's not the number one form. I'm saying fundamentally the number one thing you can do from a consumer standpoint to gain more business is take a qualified listing, tell them you did it, sell the listing, and then go back and communicate that you sold it. Okay. Because I know people that ask that question are like, there's got to be some mailer that just gets a really high hit, or there's got to be some ad that we're running on Facebook. We do have those things going, but those are not really high quality, you know, high level opportunities. Those are, those are a grind. Those are beating your head up against a wall and just, those are the extra deals. What system do you use or what program do you use to get the 20 people around that house? Is it Vulcan? Vulcan has that service inside of their uh, cold properties sells that data as well. And so does a company called Criss Cross. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Let's see. Another question is if you had to choose just one lead source, what would you pursue? What's the coveted Anybody. thing? Yeah, that was the coveted one thing question. I love the one thing because I get that a lot. Like what's the one thing that's really helped your business? The one thing that's really helped my business has always been knowing that it's not one thing. It's almost everything from my mindset to what I eat, to how much I exercise, to the words coming out of my mouth, to the books that I read, to every single person that I give access to me. So uh, nobody asked that question, but that's the answer to that question. But the answer on that is going to be the database. If there's one thing, if you could spend it, your entire budget, your entire day, every single day doing something, it would be communicating with your database. And, you know, this is where we started this whole GSD group, David, is, you know, I shared all of my closed group, Facebook group, you know, I've talked about that, how we do Shannon Group Fun, how I mean, we just get referrals because we're fun and we're inclusive and we're creating a community. And it still amazes me that agents go, I'm never going to call my database. They're the fun I'm people. I'm not fun at all. You. They chose you. Yeah. Well, you're going to get Yeah, fun. I'm not. I, well, I mean, I'm not fun. I like to have fun, but I, I don't consider myself fun necessarily. Maybe I am, but I'm going to call those people as a professional and educate them on the market or just tell them we have a house that we listed. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous that we don't do more of that. Okay. A couple questions here. David, when you have an unrepresented buyer from a signed call on your listing, how do you support with the seller remaining at 6%? That's a good question. So it's important to understand that every single deal is a business decision and a business conversation. So um, I believe that what we do to support a sale and create a sale is not just about the grunt work that we do to make it happen. You know, I, I told an expired last week, when my sign goes in your yard, you're going to get a different experience. The people are going to look at it differently. The offers are going to happen differently. I believe that at a very high level, and that is what happened. So when agents try to justify their commission based on how much work they've done, they're getting involved in the way the seller looks at it. So a commission is a solution. The reason the commission is on a sliding scale and we get paid more on bigger sales is because we're like an insurance policy. Because the bigger the deal, the higher the acuity, the bigger the problems, the better words you better hope that your person is using to make sure that that thing stays on track. So if a deal comes together and you solve the problem, the commission is not the conversation, the solution is. So if the seller says, all right, we've got a buyer for the house, now let's talk about this commission. Um, the question is, have we solved your problem? And did we agree at the time that you hired me to do it that that would be compensated at a high level if it was easy? As agents, we try to make things hard to show them how hard we're working. Absolutely not. I could get paid 6% for a three-minute conversation if I solve a lot of people's problems. So it's really understanding. I mean, you're, you're a master of scripts. You practice a lot. You know, I've shared with this group, when I first started back in sales in 2016, I had three role play partners for a year, 30 minutes with each. So I did three times a week. Now, this is after 10,000 hours of speaking and training and coaching and doing all of that, right? However, the practice is, is huge because then all of a sudden it's in your bones, it's in your reflexes. How much do you practice, David? Every day. 
So every day I role play with my team first, and every day I'm going to role play with some of the people that I coach. Both ways is very important. So if somebody, I mean, it's the only profession in the world where you can just go out and practice on people for 10 or 15, $20,000 at a time, any other profession in the world, you, it would be mandatory that for $20,000, I mean, look, football players, Patrick Mahomes, they're paying $50 million a year. He goes to practice every day for eight hours a day, minimum. And they make him practice. Does he need, you have to practice. If yeah. you're practicing on people, you're going to get beat by me every day. Well, and, and what I like to say is you're actually malpracticing because it's costing you so much money to go and wing it at a listing presentation. Yes, sir. Another question. What book are you reading right now and any that you would recommend right now? Oh, uh, yeah. So I'm one of my one of the cool things I came up or I found I didn't make it up. Um, I read a lot of the books on Kindle and I highlight this stuff on Kindle. I like paperbacks, but I'm reading on Kindle. I found this app called Readwise. So instead of scrolling Instagram or Facebook or something like that, I open Readwise and it actually scrolls the highlights from the books that I've read. And that's been really cool. So I love that. I'm reading the seven powers, the seven powers of questions. So I've been working with the team a lot on how important questions are and how a good quality question completely changes an interaction altogether where we would take a question like, are you working with an agent? Well, yeah, I'm working with an agent. Well, the question's always answered yes to that question, right? Yeah, are you working with an agent? Yeah, that means don't bother me. Or yeah, I, I don't need an agent, right? But the question could be, um, do you have an agent that when they find a really good property that's not on the MLS yet, are they calling you with it first? Well, no, I don't have that. Right, that's exactly the reason that you and I should meet. So that little exchange, the paradigm shift that's available there for a buyer is, well, no, I don't have anybody that's really looking out for me and trying to find stuff. I just send some stuff to this lady whenever something comes on the market. And if she can show me, she shows me. So seven power of questions. I'm also reading the new gold standard, which is the Ritz Carlton customer service guide. Um, we're using that in conjunction with the net promoter score. And I've just, um, I've, I'm working on a budget for every listing over 750,000 that we're going to spend $250 on that listing over about six or eight touches from the time I meet them until the time that they close. Okay. What other questions do you have? We've got him for like four more minutes. I'd love to see some more questions. We've got about 30 currently watching here. What would you love to ask David? I asked him a lot of questions the other day. I got all my deep, dark secrets out of him the other day when we were talking, which is what was important for me to follow up. Um, I, I, I've gotten all my boxes covered, Coach. I've gone through well, all the boxes on my sheet. Can you believe it? Love, love filling in all those boxes. It makes you feel accomplished, doesn't it? How important is a business well, plan? I mean, you, you know that I've written this crazy class with my partner, Stacy, and I know that you love business planning. If you're an agent and you don't have a plan, what would you tell them? You know, the business plan is, an always, so I go through that process with multiple agents every year. The business plan is always something like, oh, I need to do that. I'm going to set aside a bunch of time to sit down and really just map my life out. And it never happens that way. It happens in 20 to 30 minute blocks. So you have to plan it that way. Um, you have to, um, you have to say twice a week, I'm going to take 20 minutes. I'm just going to look at and think about what's our plan right now. And it's got to be a basic plan that I'm connected to. So how many people a day am I going to talk to? How many people a week? How many listing appointments? How many listings taken? How many price reductions? How many deals will fall apart? How many buyers are we going to sell? The basics of the business. And most people feel like they don't have data, so they don't fill that out. Well, a business plan is a working fluid document. You fill that business plan out. At some point in the year, you become disconnected with what you've written, right? I'm not teaching you anything on this, but my, but my thought on it is it's got to be something that's really ingrained in your process to look back at that. And what I notice is this. It, when I set the business plan, I, I reached the goal this year, by the way, that's been on my business plan for a couple of years. 
I've realized that it always takes me a couple years to get to a previous plan. But I also realize that that's part of the plan, that I have that in place, that I have a three-year and a five-year. And if I'm reaching for that stuff, then I'm always ending up where I intend to, just not always at the right time. And it's important to remember that it doesn't matter how long it takes you to get there as long as you get there. Yeah, and by the way, this is why I switched completely out of a 12-month plan to go to a 12-week plan because it's fluid. And as a coach for yeah. years, you know, we would do the recap every month. Then we'd do a quarterly review, and then they'd be behind. They'd just throw in a drawer and never look at it again. Yeah, it's garbage. Gone. Okay, a couple more questions. What is your When does your day start? When does your day end? Uh, 5 o'clock, wake up. T uh, breakfast to make uh, breakfast for the kids. It's like six forty. So five o'clock, wake up, work out. Every day that you work, you should work out minimum. If you're over forty, every day that you're alive, you should work out. All right. So that that's that's what I believe on that. Maybe over thirty, depending on if you're big boned. Um, if <laughs> uh, and then I'm going to be at the office by eight eight fifteen, and then I have my shadow that starts. So we start prospecting at eight thirty. I typically leave the office. How often do you take your kids to school and drop them off? Every day. Okay. I, I wanted I wanted you to add that because I freaking love your V Squad videos on Facebook. And you have four yeah, kids. Just talk, yeah, four kids, and they're all, you know, they all go to school, and I take them there every day. And sometimes I film some of that stuff and put it on Facebook so people know that uh, that I have a heart. You you have a giant heart, especially for those babies, and you have triplets. I mean, you have yeah. two girls, two boys. They're adorable. If you're not friends with them on yeah. Facebook, go watch the V Squad. Holy crap, it's awesome. Okay, um, I have a. What do your weekends look like? Saturday is always a work day for me. It's a little lighter, and I enjoy that day because I get to work on systems. I get to do lead follow up, but it's on the schedule as a work day. Uh, Sunday is not a work day. Family day. That's it. Yeah. What time do you end your day? Um, so I get home for dinner uh, usually around between 6.45 and 7 o'clock every night. Okay. I could probably be there sooner, but at this point, I feel like we have a lot of exciting things to work on. Okay. Weakness, oh, let's see. Um, we're going to put the colors in the in the group. A lot of people ask, what are the colors again? We'll post that. Oh. Just text okay. me. Yeah, we'll post that in the group. I have a yeah. weak sphere of influence. How do you expand it to a stronger base? Um, so people don't recognize who's actually in the database because they don't identify that there's people in there they should be asking for referrals. So you have to do a couple of things first. Number one, go to your checkbook and see who you're spending money with. If you look at your check, if you look at the, the company's bills and you determine who you're spending money with, that's a group of people. That I mean, honestly, the one that usually gets people to jar loose on that is um, the person that cuts their hair. They're like, oh, yeah, she's been cutting my hair for 10 years. I never asked her to, for a referral. Why? If anybody's doing business out of you, you have to understand, start with wherever it is. Is it on your phone? Download it, get it somewhere, and at least start collecting it. Right? So the number one company in the world is Amazon. They collect every single time I click on something. They know that I'm clicking on it. And all of that information about me is what makes them a multi-billion dollar company. So my company's objective is to know more about the people that we work with for that reason. So you got to start thinking about the people you know. They're everywhere. One of the favorite exercises we always did in bold was called the yellow page exercise, where you start with the A's and you go, who's my accountant? Who's my auto mechanic? Did you see what I did yesterday on that? You didn't. I posted on Facebook. I posted a list of all the vendors, like examples, and I just put it on my Facebook and I said, tag yourself if you have a business. And I already have like 40 people that have just tagged it and raised their hand and said, I'd like to get give and, and get referrals from you. Now I'm going to go back through and call each one of those people and talk to them about how we can do that. Okay. I'm, there's, so there's an idea. I'm stealing that. I hope you all wrote that down. I'm all about vendors. That's an, that's an awesome way to get them to tag themselves. And then obviously, if you have a closed group, you're going to put those vendors in your closed group too so that you can highlight them and help their businesses grow and create a more community. Uh, do you take calls, negotiate deals, et cetera, after you get home or on Sunday? 
so typically, so I don't handle that part of our company. Um, the, the offer process comes through to Janae, who's been with me for 10 years. I do prospect, lead follow-up, and appointments. That's what I do. Uh, negotiations and presentation of offers happens uh, Monday through Saturday, typically because we also have to talk to the lenders involved in the sale. So most offers are presented in that time or presented Monday morning at 9 o'clock. Okay. So if not, how do you communicate with those agents and your clients if they call you during those times? Um, so it's, I don't want to make it too complex. I'm not going to manage most of that communication because I'm not the person they want to talk to on that. But if I, when I'm an individual agent, like a lot of people are, mm -hmm. it, um, there is a time for us to do business and there's a time for us to not do business. I, I don't believe that it should be this hard, like I never answer the phone when I'm at dinner or anything like that. You have to, if you're doing everything you're supposed to do during the day and you're managing your time properly, there shouldn't be a whole lot that flows to you. If you find that your phone's ringing a lot at night, it's because you haven't leveled expectations and you haven't done your job during the day. Most of the people call me at nine o'clock haven't worked all day. So we say, we'll call you tomorrow and they're offended by that. But it's not about us. It's about their schedule. So if you're struggling with that, it's because, one, you don't respect your own schedule. And, two, you don't respect other people and what they're doing in their job. We don't have that problem a lot. Any fleeting thoughts that you want to leave people with of any of the conversations that we've covered today? Uh, fleeting thought. I, you know, I, I appreciate the opportunity to come on and talk to everybody about some of the systems. I mean what I say about sharing those systems with everybody. That's something that I've always believed in and always done. If there's people in our market, it's pretty common that because of our direct business strategy that people think that we're difficult to deal with um, be, just because we repre represent our clients at a high level. But the, we have a very open door policy when it comes to everything that we do to serve the clients. The customer experience and the clients are first. And it's my belief also that the agents that we cooperate with deserve a really high level of respect and service from us as well, even though sometimes it's difficult for us to engage in that relationship. So when I have a group of people that I talk to that are also in our market, I like to share that thought because it is one of my company's initiatives. So you and I first met, we've never actually met in person, which is hilarious. You realize that, right? Is that true? It's true. I promise you it's true. We first met because I was at another company and you sent me a referral to go compete on because it was in my market and not in your area. And you thought, all right, I'm going to make a referral fee. Off you know what's better? <laughs> no, you know what happened? I called okay. the for sale by owner. That's what happened. I called the for sale by owner. I said, I want to set an appointment. He said, I've already interviewed five people. I'm tired. I don't want to interview more agents. And I said, fine, since you're on the phone, it's my obligation to help you anyways. Tell me the five people you've interviewed and I'll tell you who to choose. He says the five. I said, these are the two you should consider. You were one and there was one other. And I said, let me look real quick and I'm going to look at stats. I'm going to tell you who you need to hire. I looked you up based on his area. I said, you need to hire her. I didn't know you. I looked at your numbers. He said, thank you for that. I really appreciate it. And he hired you and he got the home sold. That was a different one. Was you it? Referred me. You referred me one in Western Lenexa. I was on my way oh. transferring companies and you sent out two because he said, if you don't <laughs> the next day, you're not going to come list my house. And you looked up and said, okay, who's out there? And that's how we first met. And then like Funny. six months later, I was having trouble with the seller and I referred him back to you. Remember that one? You the did. seller out of California you that did. was difficult and wanted to cut our commission mm -hmm. right at the end. And you called me and you go, hey, you're my partner on this. What do you think? And I said, hell no. And he goes, that's what I think too. Hell no, we're not cutting our commission. And oh. you, you sold that one. So anyway, I just, I want you guys to know that everybody that comes on here on GSD and interviews are people that Stacy or I have great relationships with. We are putting you with people that really come from a high level of contribution. And we're really here to help you build your freaking systems and get shit done so that you quit having excuses to not have crazy awesome numbers. And that's, that's really it, right? All right. Yeah. Anything else before we turn off our live? I don't have any more questions. Cool. I'll take them. If they want to post them on there, I'll share screenshots or links or whatever you guys want. 
Okay, definitely the color marbles. Thank you guys so much for joining us today in GSD. We'll look forward to talking to you next week.